Hello and welcome to part four of the Cambrian Explosion. So we are going through these reasons for the Cambrian Explosion. And the second big reason is the evolution of the Bilaterian Developmental Toolkit. So let me explain what that series of words means. So the first concept we need to know is the concept of bilateral symmetry. And this figure does a good job of explaining that. So you and I have bilateral symmetry, which means that we have a left and a right side. We have a ventral and a dorsal side, which is another way of saying a front and a back side. And we also have anterior and posterior ends. We have heads and butts. Animals that have bilateral symmetry have these three axes, a left-right axis, a ventral dorsal axis, and an anterior posterior axis. And it's helpful to compare that to animals that do not have bilateral symmetry. So a coral has radial symmetry. It does not have a left and right. It does not have a ventral and dorsal, and it, uh, it, and it may have an anterior posterior, but it doesn't have the other two. A sponge has no symmetry at all. It's a big blob of cells. Most of the phyla of animals have bilateral symmetry. So as we just said, sponges do not have symmetry. The cnidarians mostly have radial symmetry. And all of these other animal groups we tend to think of as having bilateral symmetry. There are a couple of interesting exceptions. The echinoderms, for example, often have radial symmetry, but interestingly enough, we think they actually evolved from ancestors that had bilateral symmetry. You and I have bilateral symmetry, um, annelids have bilateral symmetry, arthropods have bilateral symmetry. So this bilateral symmetry is something that brings together most of the groups of animals. Within that group of bilateral animals, you, we have two main subgroups, the deuterostomes and the protostomes. Vertebrates and echinoderms belong to the deuterostomes and basically all of the other animals, like all of the different kinds of worms and arthropods are protostomes. And these two different categories um, you can see are associated with ancient an ancient evolutionary split going back even before the Ediacaran, the split had already occurred, or so this phylogenetic tree predicts. And it's uh, associated with differences in the development of these groups of animals. So let's talk more about development, because this is a really important uh, innovation in the evolution of animals. We were already talking about the development of blastulas and gastrulas during animal development. And this is something that's homologous among all of the animals. So now let's think about how do you build a worm or a snail or an octopus or a bee or a lizard or a human from this exact same starting point, because all of those kinds of animals all have the same developmental progression up until this point, and even beyond that. So how do you get all that those diversities of animal anatomy with the same overall developmental plan? It turns out the answer to that question is something that scientists have only discovered relatively recently. This is one of the major scientific discoveries of the 20th century, is how animal development works on a genetic level. So first of all, I think it's helpful to understand what the answer is not. And the answer is not that different animals have completely different sets of genes. So we do not have completely different developmental genes than lizards, for example. It's actually the opposite. We actually have a remarkably similar set of developmental genes as lizards or worms or bees. <coughs> <coughs> So I think it's helpful to understand what the answer is not. And the answer is not that different animals have completely different sets of genes. It is not the case that we have completely different developmental genes than lizards or bees. Actually, the answer is exactly the opposite. We have a remarkably similar set of developmental genes as bees or lizards or worms. And the reason is because development is controlled by a set of master control genes, which is what this figure is showing. So different animals have only very slightly different versions of the same master control genes, which control the activation of other genes, which control the activations of other genes. And so you have this network of regulation where a very small number of master control genes control the turning on and the turning off of many other genes. So with the same set of master control genes, you can turn on or off different components of an overall system and the turning on or turning off of different components of that system means that you develop a bee or a lizard or a human or a worm. 
and a major uh, category of these master control genes are called Hox genes, which is short for homeotic genes. There are um, multiple kinds of uh, these master control genes for development, and the Hox genes are some of the most important. Here is a figure showing the distribution of the Hox genes among different animals. So here again, we have the common ancestor of all animals. We have sponges, <clears throat> various kinds of worms, arthropods, vertebrates, and you can see that the um, homeotic genes in vertebrates are um, have a lot of overlap with the homeotic genes in flatworms or mollusks. Each one of these boxes represents one gene. Different colored boxes are different kinds of Hox genes. And um, vertebrates have a similar set of genes as other animals do. But the interesting thing about vertebrates is they have multiple copies of the same genes. Multiple copies of those genes allow them to turn on and off slightly different sets of genes, which allows vertebrates to develop in slightly different ways than worms or arthropods or jellies. So how exactly do these Hox genes control the development of animals? Well, it goes back to this concept of bilateral symmetry. Again, bilateral symmetry means you have a left and a right side, a ventral dorsal side, and anterior-posterior side. And the Hox genes define this anterior-posterior axis. So a gradient of Hox gene expression defines different segments along this anterior-posterior axis. And this is the origin of segmentation of animal bodies. Um, so different genes, for example, these other genes that we're not going to talk about today, are define the dorsal-ventral axis, and other genes define the left-right axis, the Hox genes define this anterior-posterior axis, which is what we're going to focus on today, because that's a very different, uh, a very important component of segmentation of animal bodies. And segmentation is important because it allows the development of regionalized uh, anatomical systems. For example, the central nervous system is uh, enabled by the segmentation of the animal body. You get the evolution of the head where many of the sensory systems are localized and concentrated. You only get that because of the development controlled by these Hox genes. You get digestive systems that are um, developed along the segmentation plan, right? We have mouths and anuses. You can only um, have a digestive system connecting the mouth and anus with this um, segmentation defined by the expression of these Hox genes. Here is an example of how a circulatory pump, also known as a heart, is uh, controlled. The development of this heart is controlled by expression of Hox genes, defining these different animal body segments. Here is a photoreceptor, also known as an eye. Again, um, another element of this evolution of the head. Again, the head being defined by this expression of Hox genes and the segmentation pattern. So going back to the Cambrian explosion, we can see that these things were already apparent uh, in the fossils of the Cambrian explosion. Here is one of the most abundant fossils of the Cambrian explosion. Um, and you can see that it already has many of these features we've been talking about. It has bilateral symmetry. It has eyes, it has a head, it has mouth parts. These are all things that we associate with modern animal anatomy and were not present during the Ediacaran. Interesting thing about this one is that it actually has compound eyes, a relatively recent discovery of these fossils. Um, apparently these compound eyes have up to or more than 16,000 lenses, and so the resolution is similar to that of dragonflies, which have 28,000 lenses in their eyes today. And it was pretty clearly a predator. It was um, swimming around the Cambrian Ocean trying to eat other animals. And therefore, it almost certainly had hox genes or the ancestors of the same hox genes that control animal development today. So once again, bilateral symmetry we've seen allows the development of specialized organs and tissues and overall anatomical physiological systems. For example, a musculoskeletal system that allows you to swim and catch prey it allows the development of the head with sensory, organ, sensory organs and a brain. It allows active foraging, it allows predators and herbivores, 
and you get much more complex and dynamic interactions between species. So you have these complicated ecological networks of predator and prey, and um, that leads to evolutionary arms races, as we have already started to talk about with the evolution of shells and other and spines and other things that protect prey from their predators. And then the predators have to evolve ways to get around those defenses. And that is what leads to an evolutionary arms race. And that must have been another big factor in the sudden explosion and the diversity of fossils in the Cambrian explosion. So self quiz, sorry about the um, text going over the side here. Uh, but your self quiz for today is which groups of animals have bilateral symmetry? So think about that to yourself. And then the second question is, which groups of animals have Hox genes? So finally, the third big category of explanations for the Cambrian explosion are ecological explanations. We were just talking about evolutionary arms races between predators and prey, for example. This was enabled by the increase in oxygen concentrations, as we've already talked about. Uh, burrowers opened up the microbial mats of the seafloors to gain access to ocean floor sediment. The evolutionary arms races between predators and preys gave rise to the evolution of shells, exoskeletons, sensory systems, locomotory systems, which means uh, movement, swimming, crawling, and so on, trying to get away from prey or catching prey. And this coevolution produces greater diversity and greater ecological complexity. So one more example of how these evolutionary arms races um, are manifested in the fossil record. So again, the Cambrian explosion, we had this um, explosion in burrowers and walkers and swimmers and macro predators. And the trilobites are some of the most famous examples of these. So you've probably heard of trilobites. They're a very famous fossil, perhaps the most famous fossil in the world, except dinosaurs, I guess. But what you might not know is that the reason why trilobites are famous is because there are hundreds and hundreds of species of trilobites. It's not just one or a few trilobite species. There are hundreds of different species of trilobites. They were incredibly diverse. Many of them you can find in Utah. And this graph is, is, is an overview of some of the amazing diversity of trilobites. So you see that they start here in the Cambrian. So they are associated with the Cambrian explosion and time is going from bottom to top here. So as time is going forward towards the top, there is this huge adaptive radiation of trilobites where the left to right axis is giving you a sense of the diversity. And we're not going to learn all these different names of different groups of trilobites. I just want to point out that there are in fact many different groups within the trilobites that have been identified by uh, paleontologists because trilobites went extinct uh, in the Permian, uh, so before the time of the dinosaurs, and that's why we don't have trilobites today. But that, back during the Cambrian and Ordovician, there were just so many different species of trilobites, and I think the reason for this is not entirely known, but at least part of it is the evolution of these defensive structures, like spines. They were trying to get away from predators. And um, that's one of the big uh, characteristics of the Cambrian explosion, is you much of this diversification was driven by biological interactions, so ecological interactions between different species, not only responses to the abiotic environment. So I just use that term adaptive radiation, and so let's explore that term. So an adaptive radiation is the rapid production from a single lineage of many descendant species. And so I'm using the trilobites as this example. So if you had one ancestral trilobite, a single ancestral lineage, that gave rise to many different species in a short period of time. The descendant species have a wide range of adaptive forms. The adaptive radiations are observed as the sudden appearance of related diverse species in the fossil record or inferred by phylogenetic analysis. So I already said that it's a sudden appearance in many related and diverse species. We know about the trilobites from the fossil record, and you can also notice that these adaptive radiations can occur simply by analyzing phylogeny as well. The three hallmarks of an adaptive radiation, they're monophyletic. All of these trilobites are descended from the same ancestor, therefore they are monophyletic. They speciate rapidly, and there is an ecological diversification into many niches, so diff many different ecological roles 
some of these trilobites were doing slightly different things in their ecosystems than other trilobites. Here's your study guide for the Cambrian Explosion lecture, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.